Head Striker ends up being called back into action once the computer to a passenger space shuttle goes rogue and diverts course directly to the sun. We save the day once again, or crack under the pressure. Hello, everyone. I'm Kale Luger. I'm Connor Izagiri. Welcome to a new episode of Beyond the Bad. <laughs> Today we'll be talking about sequel to the very beloved spoof film Airplane to the sequel. A film which seems to just spend most of its time recycling the original jokes and wasn't well received thanks to that reason. Um, critics weren't too kind to it, and audiences answered with their money spent, or, or in this case, lack thereof, at the box office. On that note, I'll show you over to my buddy Connor here for those scores. Airplane 2, the sequel. It is remarkably hard to follow a amazing comedy. And, you know, we see that throughout. Airplane 2, 42% on Rotten Tomatoes, 50% audience score. No critics consensus because not enough people have apparently bothered to review this. But uh, you know, it's you can just you can just kind of compare legacies here. Airplane re-released constantly, considered one of the greatest comedies of all time. Airplane two, we might be the first people to talk about this since it's nineteen eighty two. So there it is. <laughs> it, yeah, I I know because you had seen it, and then Josh had actually or seen it, so I asked was like, you know, kind of got an opinion before I watched it, like, oh, what should I expect? And Josh pretty much repeated what you said, which was like, he's like, yeah, it's like, he goes, man, they, they try, but it's a lot of repeated gags that just don't hit as hard, and it just, it, there's some stuff that works, and then stuff there isn't, and he goes, I laughed, he, I think, and Josh said, he, like, he laughed the most at the beginning, like, the opening skit, and after that, I was like, okay, nothing after that. <laughs> um, and watching it, I get it. You know, yeah, some stuff hits, but it's nothing like Airplane, where it seemed like almost every single joke just landed. I, I guess intended. <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, yeah, I get that to an extent. I, this time around, believe it or not, I actually liked it a lot more. Uh, there are moments in this movie that, yeah, it's a lot of recycled gags, but I was I found myself laughing quite frequently. I... I enjoyed it. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go to bat for this one. You wait till now to do this to me. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I don't like change. Think on your feet, buddy. Think on your feet. God no. <laughs> um, it. I I I think for me, like the new stuff worked. Like the jokes that weren't fucking recycle jokes worked, and I was laughing at a lot of them. But man, when this one was like, hey, let's just repeat something, it was never as good. That That's was the true. biggest thing is that, like, if you're going to repeat a gag, and I get the idea of doing it occasionally, like, it is funny to have that repeat gag carry over. It's an old, one of the oldest comedy tricks in the book. But it needs to work when you do it, and they don't really make it work in this one when they do do the repeat gags. Two words danger vacuum. <laughs> that bit was funny as hell. I will say the one repeating that thing that did work was um bringing back people not liking Ted stories. <laughs> like when he's like, I'm sure when he was in the mental asylum. He's like, I'm sure you, I could go on about this, but I probably don't want to bore you guys. And they all pull out the guns and then the doctor, no, no, please go on. And you just hear the gunshots. My, that made me laugh. I was laughing on that. My favorite repeating my repeated gag. Cause this worked so well in the first one. And they really kind of double down with this on this, in this movie are the miscommunication dialogues like you know when the when the therapist is on uh on the stand and the guy asked him can you give us your impression of ted striker he goes oh i don't do impressions my expertise is in psychology <laughs> like i love i love that kind of shit that always makes me laugh yeah i oh, was like the pilot kept sitting there being like no i don't want to do that but i think you should go back there after they've said something like yeah i should go back there <laughs> yeah i love when uh when uh, McCloskey's like, striker, striker. And then the guy behind her is like, well, okay. And punches the woman. Oh, I laughed. My, I'm not <laughs> condoning hitting women, but much like Bill, Bill Burr. But no, I'm kidding. Uh, 
it was a really funny joke, especially because, yeah, he does that quick, like, all right. Like, he can tell he's like, I don't want to do this, but if he says so, <laughs> and punches the shit out of her. Like, God damn. <laughs> Yeah, I did. That's, yeah, I did like the the guy that anytime like McCloskey kept trying to like get facts about something, the guy would come up with like some random bit of trivia. <laughs> well, I said there was like that's what I said. Some stuff there was just like, a lot of the repeat gags didn't work. I like the repeated gag of uh, you know over Macho Grande. It's like I don't know if I'll ever get over Macho Grande. <laughs> like several characters said that. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I ever get over much. I did like William Shatner in this. I did get a good he, laugh out of him. When he when his introduction, when he's on the computer screen, it's like, no tower? God damn it, why aren't I told about these things? And he opens the door, and he was right there. Yeah. <laughs> like when he's like guiding him to land, and like they've landed, and he is still going. I like what he's like, it's, it's okay, like, you know, like you have lights up there, we all have lights blinking, and flashing and i don't know how to handle this and he has a breakdown <laughs> the guy's like get a hold of yourself and he's like i'm okay i'm okay and then goes right back to talking him down <laughs> see there's this has it's got its moments i think it's worth watching it's it's funny it's not airplane but you know it's not hangover three either like it's a it's a decent okay comedy if to me airplane is a solid four and a half to five star film like it's a fucking hilarious film oh it's a 10 it's always been a 10 for me i yeah. i yeah it's comfort food. I think it's absolutely hilarious. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty much flawless film. This one, if we're doing like on a film guys scare, I'd give it like a six or a seven. Like it's not the worst thing I've seen by any means, but uh, it just it just doesn't compare to the first film at all. And that's just because yeah, I think they I think they should well we'll get into it, but they should have found a better way to match the new jokes with the old or just not have so much repeat gags. Focused me on getting some new jokes in there and then bringing back some of the repeats. I, I think the a tightening of the script to sum it all up, it would have probably helped a little bit. I agree. I think just comedy sequels in general don't usually work because comedy is such a spur of the moment, creative moment of genius where like when you've got it and it hits, it's impossible to duplicate. And trying to make more of that is impossible. You know, it's, You'll make, you might be able to make something that's okay, but it's, it rarely stands on its own. I can't, like, I can't really off the top of my head name like any real like amazing comedy sequel, except maybe like 22 Jump Street. But, you know, you got to go meta with it or it's not going to work, I guess. I don't know. It's just, I yeah. find comedy is almost impossible to sequelize. Yeah, comedy has always had like an issue with this. Like, don't I know? There's some that do work. Like, I do think Anchorman 2 is funny as shit. Um, mm-hmm. and I- and I do think a good chunk of the scary movie sequels work, um, at least up to five. Um, but again, those are like one in like a billion, it seems. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's way more like Dumb and Dumber twos, and yeah, it's yeah, yeah. For every Anchorman two or scary movie two, three, whatever. I know for a lot of people, three is like the favorite sequel. Um, when it comes to scary movie. You get yeah, you get Dumb and Dumber, uh, what was it, Dumb and Dumber or Dumb and Dumber Two, whatever the fuck they called the one where they actually came back. Yeah, that was Dumb and Dumber Two. Okay, Dumb and Dumber Two or Zoolander Two or, you know, anything else that like just doesn't connect nearly as well with people. Nope, that's but you know what, it gives us plenty of fodder for this show, so I'll yeah. take that as a it's plenty of bad comedies to sit through. Um, but. <laughs> So uh, for my, uh, oh my gosh, for my question, I was actually, for once, I didn't hone in on the sequel thing yet. I said, let's save the comedy sequel question for a later one, whenever we do another comedy sequel. I went in on what this film is, and that's just a spoof and parody, right? So my question to you is, what do you think makes these type of comedies, spoof parodies work, and then what doesn't? <laughs> okay. I like that. Um I think the best thing a spoof movie can have is self-awareness. It needs to be, you know, you got to be aware of what you're making. It's not, you know, it's not often a masterpiece. It's just to be goofy, but you also have to try. That's why I think, you know, the first three scary movies work, but scary movie five is a dumpster fire 
because it, they just threw a bunch of shit in and hoped people would just laugh at references. You can't have just references. You need jokes. That's why the Naked Gun trilogy is the undisputed king of parody franchise. Because those movies are hilarious, self-aware. They know exactly what they're doing. And you've got just deadpan delivery, which I think is like crucial to a spoof. You got to have just, a, you know, the quote unquote straight man delivering goofy shit, but believing it. And Leslie Nielsen was the king of that. Uh, but yeah, I love a good spoof, a good parody. Uh, as long as, you know, the filmmakers and the actors involved know what they're making. They got to have some knowledge of what they're making fun of. They got to have some inside jokes for people who are aware of that stuff. But also it has to be, you know, singularly funny enough to stand on its own. That's why Airplane works so well. It's like I'd never seen it. The movie it's parodying is Airport from 1970, 70, 1970. And I had never seen that when I saw Airplane. But I still loved Airplane. And because it's its own thing. And then I watched Airport and actually that kind of sucked. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's uh, that I think that's what you need. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I think you need to. And the first scary movie, really, first two really did it. You need I think it works when you find a movie as your overarching plot to use. And then you can sprinkle jokes that are actually kind of like related and spoofs are related to what you're doing. Because, yes, obviously, like you said, the main thing is airport. But a lot of their jokes that they are throwing in, all the references they're throwing into airplane are tangentially related somehow to the, the film and the genre and stuff like that. So it all makes sense. Same with like when Scary Movie did like the first one. Yes, the plot line is wholeheartedly going after Scream, but they're pulling other Scary Movie jokes and other stuff with the occasional timely reference for the time it came out. Um yeah. And I think that's usually the best way. It's that it, it gives you a focus, right? It says, okay, this is what we're focused on, but also, and then mixing references, joke references with just actual jokes. I think that's the key thing. You watch Airplane, yes, there's plenty of, or even Scary Movie or The Naked Gun, there's plenty of jokes in reference to some kind of movie or some kind of pop culture event, but there's also just jokes being made. Your standard, here's the, here's the you know, opening joke, here's the punchline, you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. Airplane has my all time favorite movie joke. It's uh, when Captain Over gets the white courtesy phone and he's talking to uh, the Mayo Clinic. And I mean, first you get the sight gag of like you know, all the mayonnaise of the Mayo Clinic. I, I thought that was funny. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's talking to the guy and he's the operator comes on. He's like, um, Captain Over, you have a collect call from Mr. Ham. And Captain Over goes, all right, give me ham on five. Hold the Mayo. <laughs> The structure of that joke is perfect. I laugh every time. I'm like that the build up to that, like so many different jokes had to work for that one to work, and it's just the delivery is great. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. M15 hold the mayo. <laughs> you know, so there's it's there's no reference to a film. It's just a joke that they put in there, and it worked. Um, or think about when you know the pilot's going, Billy. Have you ever seen grown men shower together? Like that's not a reference to anything. That's just them fucking joking. And seeing like, let's just say shit to this kid and see what happens. You ever been in a Turkish prison? <laughs> yeah. It's, there's no movie reference, just a joke, and it fucking works. It's hilarious, and they just keep having it get more ridiculous as we keep cutting to it. Um, and then, you know, obviously, Naked Gun's done it. Scary Movie used to do it before they uh, went into that. But I think that helps a lot. And then I do think, yes, I think obviously, it, I think you have to have a mixture of people that are obviously in on the joke. And in on like the type of goofiness that's happening and be over the top and goofy. I think in airplane's case, and to an extent too, that's what like the passengers to supporting carriage can play. They can kind of play that over the top goofy and give you those scenes where they're just slapping that one. Get all of yourself, woman. Come on. <laughs> one of my favorite sight gags is when they're looking for a doctor and they find Leslie Nielsen and is like, um, sir, are you a doctor? And he's sitting there with a fucking stethoscope on and he's like, Well, yes, I am a doctor. <laughs> it's like this is great. <laughs> yeah. So you, 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 <laughs> don't call me Shirley. <laughs> but uh, then if you mix that though with someone like, like you said, Les Nelson was the king at this, mainly because he was a traumatic actor. A lot of people don't remember that. But the guy did a lot of, I, he was on fucking Murder, She Wrote episodes. He was like a recurring character. Um, because of that, he, he would could deliver those very dry. He was a very dry with his humor. 
And I think, and a lot, they did it a lot more in the older spirits than they did like kind of scary movie onward. And that's just how the Wayans do theirs, which is totally fine. It worked for them. Um, but like back then they would have, and uh, Kubrick did it too, to an extent with a lot of his actors that weren't, um, uh, God damn it. For C. Scott, um, he told him to be as goofy as possible because they're not actually filming. Um, <laughs> but you know, you would have, they would have their actors for these comedies be deathly serious which made it so much more funny like you're getting in people like you know again leslie nelson who was known for traumas at the time lloyd bridges like in this sequel you got chuck fucking connors like people that are known to be very serious actors playing it serious which makes it so much more funny when you watch it um and again i'm not saying like the scary movie thing worked for the way as far as like having the actors be in on it and then be able to talk it works to an extent but you have to know how to do that yeah yeah you do like i think that's why scary movie three is my favorite because you've got it's the guys who made airplane are the guys doing that and they got leslie nielsen to you know be in that one as the president he gets one of my favorite lines which is uh when he finds out about the aliens and he's like we might be facing a national crisis get me the president and <laughs> jaw rules like you are the president he's like oh good then i already know about this <laughs> We're not so different after all. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. So a good parody is is great, but honestly, they are few and far between. Is everyone always, you know, goes too far into just references? I was like, you know, the those two assholes who made Epic Movie. Oh, that like, onslaught of films we got with Epic oh. Movie and Date Movie and Yeah. The, the Meet the Spartans and oh God. That endless dumpster fire is all just, you know, let's throw references into this and people will laugh because like, oh, I saw 300. Oh, I saw Harry Potter. That's it. There's no, there's nothing of substance in any of those movies. It's all dreck. Yeah. And it's, yeah, they they killed the parody movie straight up. Yeah, because all they did was, and this is where I would go into what doesn't work, right? What we kind of allude to. It's like, you're just throwing jokes. You're not hearing about actually setting up punchlines or anything like that. Classic joke, joke structure at all. You're, and now I'm curious how your references match, right? First off, they were lazy with the title. They just did what Scary Movie did, which, again, worked for Scary Movie because guess what Scream was going to be called? Scary Movie. But they changed it to Scream. So yeah. Scary well, movie that, took that and you've got the Wayans brothers behind it who are comedians, who are funny dudes and know what they're doing. And then you yes. know, they had the Zuckers for three. So, like... You need to be funny to make comedy. I feel, I feel like this isn't news, but a lot of people in Hollywood don't fucking know that, apparently. No. So you have guys that just took what they did, which for Scary Movie worked because you got to know. I mean, Grant, you have to know the history about how they even got that title. But it, that's what was it, the title alone is what was being the spoof. Like, hey, huh, we took Scream's fucking title, original title. Not only that, we're going to spoof Scream. Um and they just did that with their damn movies. They're like, yeah, date date movie, epic movie, disaster movie, blah, 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 superhero film. You know, like, they just kept doing that. And then, yeah, they would just throw references. Half the references didn't really match with even the title of the film. Like, I think, like, epic movie had, like, a Narnia plot line that got actually kind of, like, creepy and rapey there. Um, it's all I, creepy I, and rapey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, because I've fortunately seen some of these films, and I regret the ones I've seen. Um, but yeah, they would just throw it hoping you would laugh, and you, I, I never did not a single time. I think they still work, but now instead of getting theatrical releases, they get like the occasional like direct to video streamer release. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know who keeps paying for this shit. Um, I'm hoping they just, you know, now that they're no longer in theaters, that they're on like you know streaming. I'm hoping they just get smaller and smaller and smaller. Until they like Benjamin Button themselves out of existence. Come One can off. dream. Yeah, so that I would argue is how it doesn't work. Like you can't just throw stuff and hope. And also, they never had a through line. Like there's never like one movie using as a basis in those films. It was always like, now we're going to start making fun of Narnia, and now we're going to do Pirates of the Caribbean. And it was like you got to have. Again, what makes a lot of these work and naked gun, you know, they would pick a, a, a film as a baseline in that case, police procedures, you know, and roll with that so then you can make everything else work within it. So you gotta have you gotta have the spine, you know, you gotta have the backbone 
So then everything else you're putting in there works with it. If you're just throwing shit in there, I'm just watching what it feels like a fucking a horrendous sketch show. Well, to me, it's just it, it shows the difference between comedians and people who think that they're funny. Typically, if you think you're funny, you're probably not fucking funny. Yeah. I mean, there's exceptions, but anyone who walks around saying like, oh, I'm a comedic genius, I'm hilarious. You fucking aren't. <laughs> and I feel like these guys think they are so funny. Oh, I and I bet you everybody they've ever met fucking hates them. Oh, I can't, yeah. I can't see they laugh at their own, own fucking movies. God, aren't we comedic geniuses? <laughs> yeah, it's obnoxious. Yeah, so yeah, that's that is our thoughts right there on uh what we think works and doesn't work. I figured that'd be a more fun question, and I could save the anything related to comedy sequels when we do a more standard comedy sequel. At some yeah, point. we got no shortage of them. That's for damn sure. No, everyone says like, oh, making sequels to horror films is the worst. And it's like, no, I'd argue comedy has it the worst. Like, there's some really great horror sequels out there. Comedy. It is so hard to count any really great ones. Like that is the hardest genre to fucking continue with another one. Yeah, damn straight. Well, unless you're a TV show, then that's a little different. You can kind of get away with doing more seasons, luckily. Yeah, well, com- I don't know how that. I I guess you know you got more writers, you got more ideas thrown around. You yeah, you got typically- ongoing storylines you can work with. Yeah, yeah. It's diff- oh. I don't know TV comparing TV and film is an endless debate that we don't really have the fuel for. No, because I'm, I'm I I like both. That's that's me. I look I like both. I just like content, so give it to me. Um. <laughs> all right, well let's move on to our development hill. It is scant this week. I kind of had to piecemeal it together because uh, if you look at the Wikipedia to this thing, it's the plot line, who's in it, reception. <laughs> So I Fair enough. Them, yeah, I, I figured this was going to be kind of, kind of scarce. Yeah. So luckily, Wikipedia came in with some interesting info that not Wikipedia. Um, IMDb has some interesting info that I hope is true. So you're probably thinking, did the original airplane writer directors do anything with this film? Those people being Jim Abrahams, David Zucker, and Jerry Zucker, also referred to as Zucker Abraham Zucker, which I think. <laughs> It's actually, it throws off the tongue. Um, They were the original writing and directing crew of Airplane. They've done numerous other, you know, spoof films. They are comedy, like, legends in Hollywood at this point. Um, To answer the question I posed, they had no involvement in the sequel. They haven't even seen this sequel since its release. Their, their refusal to watch it. Ouch. Glad yeah. you know they're not bitter. Um, because they did initially agree to a sequel when approached. They were like, yeah, sure. Something happened. I can't quite figure out what, find out what happened, but they eventually would balk at the idol at some point later. So I don't know if a studio exec pissed them off or what happened, but they at first were like, yeah, sure, we can definitely do this. And they were like, yeah, no, fuck you. (laughs) Well, studio apparently didn't seem to mind their lack of involvement because we ended up getting their plane too. Exactly, and this gets into why they've refused. The movie, because of the studio, would go ahead without their permission and despite their protests. That's just cold. <laughs> yes. But not a surprise. Exactly. Which is why, in turn, as far as I know, and the reason I found this information, I feel like, well, how do you know that they haven't watched the sequel unless they watched the sequel and said it? Well, on the airplane commentary for the the home video release is when they revealed this information. So it was on the commentary for the first one. So don't worry, people. And they that's when they admitted that because of that, they've in turn refused to watch even a single frame of Airplane Two. And considering that was when this was released on DVD, I think like the two thousands. That's well after the release of this film. I would assume they've they've kept that commitment. I can honestly say I don't think I've ever hated something that much where I'm just like, don't even look at me for 30 years. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, they I don't know what the hell was said to really piss them off. 
like to because like I said they agreed. The first was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. So something happened there, and then I guess something happened for them. The studio would be like, well, we're going to move forward. You know, fuck you. So something bad happened that is not getting put out. Uh, I would love. I hope they do a tell-all book or something. I would love to know what happened there. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't jump on the bandwagon and all the shit going on at Warner Bros. But that's for another day. Oh. <laughs> Ah, now also, as you probably have seen, there's obviously some actors that come back to perform the role, some that did not. Uh, two of two of note, the first one being Mr. Leslie Nelson, who was obviously mm-hmm. a breakout comedy star thanks to Airplane. Um, people were not expecting that, and he became since that film's release, everyone's like a comedy legend. Um, he uh, was offered to come back as Dr. Rumax. Obviously, like, no, we got to have you back. People loved you in this movie. Um, but he would turn it down due to his commitment to the comedy series Police Squad, <laughs> which was coincidentally created by Zucker Abraham Zucker. <laughs> yep, that was the what, the what the Naked Gun franchise was based on. That's great. I'm, I love that. I also think he, there might have been other reasons because in 82... He was also busy drowning Ted Danson in Creep Show, so yes. he had time to do that. So I'm I'm wondering if there was if he had some loyalty to Zucker Abraham Zucker. Well, as soon as I saw the show and who did, I'm like, I think there was loyalty. I think there was loyalty, and he was like, No, you fucked them over. I'm not coming back. Quick, great joke from Police Squad. Uh, somebody break like. Uh, somebody catches Leslie Nielsen in their office and he goes, who are you and how did you get in here? And he goes, I'm a locksmith and I'm a locksmith. <laughs> ah, he was the best. Uh, he was, and you know, it kind of worked out and, and for the best because he only further cemented his status as a comedy like fucking genius because then he, you know, did the, that show Police Squad, did the Naked Gun, which you know, people also very much, you know, highly regarded his filmography. So it's like it kind of worked out because all he did was keep doing more films that now, years later, have solidified him as the comedy, you know, icon that he is. He did a, uh, a parody in 1992 that was not well received. We could do it here. It's a bomb. But I've always thought it was hilarious. It's called Spy Hard. Oh, it's I know a, what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. He plays Dick Steele. Agent WD forty, <laughs> Andy Griffith is the bad guy. It's such a strange movie, but I thought it was funny as hell. Weird Al Yankovic does the theme song like it's a Bond movie. God. Oh, we forgot to mention that on our spoof films, the Austin Powers films. That's another case of actual good spoof films. The first one, I think, but then I think they relied too more too much on like you know just kind of gross out humor that it kind of stopped being a parody of the Bond franchise and just started kind of being kind of gross. Yeah, I mean, I like the first two a lot. I'm with a lot of people that gold members kind of like hit and miss. Like, there's some stuff that really lands in gold members, some stuff that isn't that funny. I think they're all funny in their own way. I watch them, but I do think the first one was was special. Yeah, I don't, I don't want a fourth film, no matter how much my oh, parents wants it. I don't want to see a bloated, disinterested, needing the money Mike Myers playing like eight characters. I don't want to see fat bastard again. I don't want to. I don't want that movie. Yeah, I don't want a movie where it's clear that no one else wants this. Like no one else wants to work on this because he's burned so many bridges, so he has to play all of the characters, and it's jokes from like twenty to thirty years ago. If I hear "hello" one more time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find him and I'm gonna punch him. Get in my belly. God. I want my baby back, baby back, baby back, baby back. Ah, <laughs> uh, I'll just go in there and blast him. I'll take the gun and just shoot him. You just don't get it, Scott. You just don't get it. Oh, the, yeah, that verse one's funny as hell. Oh yeah. Um. But yeah, so that's why he turned it down. So there could have been some more already. Now they are a big one for those who loved unsolved mysteries. <laughs> growing up, Robert Stack or. Josh, if you're listening to this, because I know how much it bugged you when you're watching basketball. Unsolved Mysteries guy. Um, Get me Rex Kramer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Was, this movie was missing some stack. 
He was missing some stack. Uh, he was also asked, because obviously another character that people really liked. So he was asked, and he turned them down straight up at saying he felt the script was a basic retread of the first movie. That's why he turned it down. <laughs> I, I appreciate his candor. Robert Stack does not seem like the kind of guy to bullshit you. No, I, pre- I appreciate it. I mean, look, it worked out for him. It was, I mean, Unsolved Mysteries, I don't think it was too long. It was like late 80s, right? Yeah, yeah so but- I would wasn't too long after this so he got the gig for unsolved mysteries and then fucking forever became known as the host for unsolved mysteries you too can help me turn down airplane two just call into this number you too can help solve crime tune in next week for unsolved mysteries why was there no airplane three could it have been incompetence (laughs) maybe so tune in to find out Have you have you seen basketball? I have not. Oh my god, their usage of him is so fucking great because he's just <laughs> like at one point one of the characters just goes like goes missing. He goes on thing and, and it's Robert Sack as the Unsolved Mysteries host still reporting on it. He's like, "Help us find him." Last he was reported, he was in a sweatshop in China. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> It's so. I think at one point, like he's cracking, or he says something. They fucking throw water at him on air. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so great. Cool. Yeah, I, he has one of my favorite sight gags in Airplane when he first shows up and he's like, "Listen here," and he takes off his sunglasses and he's wearing another pair of sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> ah, simplicity. Oh. Yeah, God, this is making me just want to watch the first one now. Oh, <laughs> God. But yeah, that's uh talk about I like when actors have that ability to just be like candid, like, hey, look, I thought the script fucking sucked. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I I would love to like if I had any talent and for to act, right? I would love to get to that point and be like, your script blows next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some guys can do that, you know. Character actors do that a lot because they don't need to, you know. They're not reliant on studios to really like get their work. So I'm sure like a lot of movie stars have to be like, well, you know, I've got other projects and I can't really commit to this. But, you know, somebody like, uh, I don't know, like Steve Buscemi can be like, this stinks. I can do something else better than this. Next. (laughs) I'm going to Hawaii with Adam Sandler. Fuck you. Yeah. Doesn't that mean it's like, yeah, but it's Hawaii. Ha. (laughs) Perk package, man. Perk package. <laughs> uh see Bashimi, just know that we do I in all seriousness, I think you're fucking awesome as shit. Oh, we love you. You're the, yeah. you're, the you're the boss. You're the best. Especially, yeah, especially when I heard what you did. I never knew what you did for 9 11 When I heard about that, I was like, oh my God. I, yeah, I mean, I'm always exactly. liked him, but fuck. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Steve Buscemi was a, a volunteer fireman who um on 9-11 immediately went back to his uh his firehouse and helped uh helped out on the day, you know. He was he didn't do any publicity shots or anything because that's not what it was about. It was about helping people. And then he, you know, he left. People didn't find out till like a while later. And they were like, wait a minute, Steve Buscemi was there. So yeah, nothing but respect for that man. He's 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 fantastic. Yeah. Stand up, dude. And always a welcome presence. But I I would do like that. Oh, that's what he does. Like, fuck this script. Next. <laughs> yeah. Robert Stax, I like him a lot, and he wasn't wrong. This was a retread of the first movie. Like, oh, yeah. You think, yeah. That's what's beautiful. He was, he's right. I read that. I was like, well, he's not wrong. He is right. It's a basic retread. Um, um, with that, though, guess what? This film was a bit transgressive for its time, I found out. There's a joke in this where when they think they're about to die, a man admits to his wife he had an affair with his secretary. His wife admits she had an affair with his secretary, who was also female. At the time, when this came out in 1982, that was transgressive because lesbianism was considered taboo. Ooh. So, fun well, fact. Fun historical fact there for you uh, people that like fake true stories. <laughs> nice plug. Uh I feel like it was overshadowed by the lengthy rape joke they had, so I didn't really catch the... I wasn't paying much attention to the lesbian joke. We will get to that. Oh, we will get to that. 
in our words intent um <laughs> but yeah i i didn't know that honestly i was watching it and i when they did the thing i it wasn't something i laughed at because we kind of live in a world today where like who gives a shit uh well okay we do lawmakers are trying to go back to the old ways um not gonna get into into that there but obviously i'm keeping up with stuff in case you're hunter rare. um normal people without agendas don't really give a shit there so there you go yeah but i remember watching i was like oh okay cool like i didn't it wasn't i didn't really register as it i registered as a joke the film was making i just obviously in the time now of 2022 i was like okay and then when i read that i was like oh wow it's like I forgot. I was like, oh, yeah, 1982. Eh, yeah, it makes sense. That would be like a transgressive joke at that time. Like, hey, ha ha, look at that. Touching on lesbianism, guys. Oh, oh. Yeah, but then you've got like, you know, the priest reading Alter Boy magazine like it's a Playboy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I get that uh, one. I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I, I guess it was, you know, big deal back then. But then again, I don't think many people saw this one. So, <laughs> no. Um, also, you're probably noticed something in this film. There's a lot of boobies. You're also, yes. if you weren't paying attention, this film's rated PG. So it's been noted for those who care that because of it, that this is a PG film with more new more new than some R-rated films. Fun little fact, folks. Yep. I think if you listen to our another plug on fake true stories. Uh, I feel like Isabel will enjoy this because I feel like there is a proportionate amount of tit in this film. Yes, there is. <laughs> For anyone who's wondering, like, how'd they get ready with that in PG? Quick little history in case you haven't heard before. Film ratings were weird. So there was, when it was created, there was G, PG, R. There was nothing in between PG and R. Absolutely nothing. PG-13 was not invented yet. So a lot of films on this really weird structure that they came list of guidelines they came up with after the abolishment of the Hayes code. You had to have like so um, a certain amount of nudity to grant it, or if not, it got a fucking PG. So there are like plenty of PG films from like the eighties. I think some seventies as well that have fucking nudity. I think Beastmaster is another one that's like PG, but has like nudity, uh, tourist trap, uh, early, um, full moon f- film with Tanya Roberts and Chuck Connors um, has nudity and it was PG granted that one they now will label it as uncut to you know kind of get around that nowadays but obviously when it came out it was PG with nudity so it's just something that happened and then you guys can all thank Stephen Spielberg for the PG-13 because he was getting a lot of flack for things like Temple of Doom um, his produced Poltergeist film uh <laughs> insert a lot of films he was come out with in the 80s that are making the mpa mpa at the time go what the fuck yeah you can you can pretty much thank indiana jones and the temple of doom and gremlins for the pg-13 rating so thank you although i can't imagine what you had to do to get an r rating in the late 70s early 80s short of like rampant murder foul language and just full bush i don't like that's that's all i i can't imagine yeah, apparently it's, if you show boobs, fine. Which hey, I'm all about letting those things. Let, hey, show show some boobies, show nudity, folks. Um, but apparently if you just show that PG, anything that went below the waist, I guess was like oh R rating. Can't <laughs> see that. That's so weird. We, <sighs> our our weird morals never made any fucking sense to me when it came to film. It it never makes sense. The most and the most it does now is when I watch a film like this, like Airplane Two. I'm like, oh, it's PG. It can't be that bad. Especially when I'm like, you know, through the, my current like, you know, for the holiday weekend with you know having kids around the house currently for uh, the time. I'm thinking like, oh, can I watch this around them? And then like, I look it up. I'm like, no, I can't because apparently there's fucking nudity in this PG rated film. And what kills me is that like you can change that rating now. You could totally change it. They just don't want to. <laughs> yeah, it's in the past. And who's going to complain about Airplane 2? Nobody talks about Airplane 2. <laughs> this is true. It was probably the most talk that's ever happened. 
So, yeah, there's a fun little fact in case you guys cared about uh, the nudity in this PG rated film and a little history on how we, again, if you haven't heard prior episodes on this, the whole rating thing and the weirdness of it um, that came out. Um, and then don't even get to start on like the whole NC 17X thing that's a whole other can of worms. Um, fun little thing that I found out that happened, right? So, during your pre screening, to keep with the aha type of film this is, um, <laughs> audiences were handed 3D glasses as they entered the theater. This is a specific pre-screen that happened somewhere. After a few minutes of them noticing a blurry-ass movie, the pre-screeners realized the film was not in 3D and had been duped. But wait, this is the weird part. By whom is unclear. The studio never fessed up to it. They were like, that wasn't us. That was the Zuckers. <laughs> that was them sabotaging this thing. That's what that was. That's hilarious, though, actually. Like, here's your 3D glasses, and then you're, they're just watching the movie like, wait a minute. You assholes. Yeah. This isn't 3D. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I was like, that's funny. And I thought maybe it's a promotional thing. Then they went like, no, whoever did this, no one knows. I'm like, wait, then wait, what? Was some guy like a ski mask just handing out 3D glasses and then like fucking walked off? I would love if he was charging. He's like, get your 3D glasses here. You need them for the movie. Five bucks. I walked away with like 800 bucks. <laughs> Nobody knows who he was. To the state. I, I'd love if like the film leaned into it and like there were 3D moments, but it's it was never made for 3D. It's just like, ah, like into the screen, but it's not a 3D movie. This week on Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> 3D glasses at the airplane tube premiere that I did not attend because I said no to that bullshit script. <laughs> who who handed them out? Was it me? Could have been. Am I bitter? Who knows? Not you. Find out next week. <laughs> you too could solve a mystery. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it was Robert Stack in a trench coat just being like, don't forget your 3D glasses. You know, I've heard a lot of good things about the revived um, show Unsolved Mysteries on uh, Netflix, I believe. I've heard a lot of people say it's really good. And I've seen they've kept that tone of the original series where they would have the occasional paranormal episode, which I always liked that Unsolved Mysteries did that. Did not have any issues saying, eh, let's talk about ghosts because fuck it. What else we got to do? <laughs> An unsolved mystery. We don't know. Therefore, it counts. Yeah. <laughs> They're very flimsy with those rules. Um, but I heard there's no host for that one. It's just like literally like any other thing. So I'm kind of trepidatious to watch it. So I'm like, yeah, but what made it special, the original special was in a way Robert Stack's fucking narration. I watched the first season and it is interesting. Every episode is just one case. Uh, they go deep into that case and explore, like talk to the family. And it it's really sad. Uh, it's not the old unsolved mysteries at all the un the old unsolved mysteries always had this like sleazy aspect to it i don't know what it was maybe it's the fonts maybe it's just like the the 80s and 90s and the kind of people who would be talked about on this show but yeah robert stack really made it he kept he's why he kept coming back oh yeah absolutely because I, I, I like that most of my knowledge is because my mom loved this show so i would always like end up watching it as a kid and i remember her like she loved Robert Stack. I I knew it was the Unsolved Mysteries guy because she only never fucking said his name. I didn't pay attention to credits. But she's like, God, this guy's so good at uh, the show and I love it. I was like, okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, hey, glad they were able to bring it back and do it. It's just like knowing that the I'm like, oh, I don't know. I did you know what I like? And then also another thing I like about the original show was when they would solve a mystery, the update at the end, update on episode blah blah blah. The, Thanks to viewer so and so, it made you go like, "Oh shit, a viewer solved it." I loved that. I also always thought about like the people watching that and watching unsolved mysteries at home, and they're like, "This person killed their fiance, got away with three million dollars in life insurance." Here's their latest mugshot, and you're like, "Oh shit, that's Greg." <laughs> you're like, "I know that guy." Holy shit! And you call them, and you're like, I, "He works at my building." <laughs> it's like that's got to be an insane moment. Or you recognize oh, the bad yeah. guy on Unsolved Mysteries. Right? <laughs> God, that was always insane when they did that. And they would always say, like, thanks to so-and-so that sent this picture. And now they're brought... I'm like, 
Yeah, and the so, guy's always like, I was just, you know, like every every Wednesday at eight, I turned I turned on Unsolved Mysteries like I always do. And lo and behold, there he was. I saw him at the hotel. I had to tell somebody. Okay, except that was back before DVR and stuff. So it's like you had to watch Unsolved Mysteries yeah. when it aired. You couldn't tape it, like unless you had like a tape deck and like an illegal like recording machine. So you were just, you know, eight o'clock Wednesday, Unsolved Mysteries is on. <laughs> Hope you didn't go to the bathroom during the segment where they saw the guy you know. Otherwise, he's getting away with it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, so yeah, I, yeah, so yeah, like you know, good for Netflix. I'm bringing, I'm glad people are liking it, but that's been kind of like why I haven't approached him. Like, I'm glad it's back, but hearing that just makes it feel like every other dark. And I had, and you know, I'm a true crime nut myself, so it's like, but it just feels like. Every other true crime thing, like the the specialness of the original show, is is taken now that Robert Stack isn't obviously doing it. Um, yep, yep, you're right. But now that we had that fun, unsolved mysteries tangent. Tune in next week on Beyond the Bad for more unsolved mysteries. Uh, now, uh, for those who have seen this film and watched the credits the whole way through, you may have noticed. That it promises you airplane three. I I did not watch the credits all the way through, so I didn't you, see that. You god damn it. Um apparently only one of us does the work here. Uh oof, ouch. Ah no, so yeah, at the end of the credits it says, you know, coming coming soon, airplane three, and where I'm shining says some joke that I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Um how that came about. So apparently with this sequel, it was also created with the obligation that the creative team would return for a third installment. So it was made thinking like, Hey, make a third one. And the expectations were so high on that because of how well received the first film was that they put that tag at the end of the credits. That was a legit, not no joke tag saying, "Hey, you're gonna love this sequel. Wait for Airplane 3. Ooh, ouch! Never do that. Never do that. Unless you've already filmed Part Three, never do that. Yeah, it. Even James Cameron is kind of having to like. Did you see where he's like, I may not be able to do Avatar Four and Five, and Two and Threes. Take really dictates if we do four and five. I'm like, oh, so now you're backtracking too. You're realizing we may have overshot your load there, Mr. Cameron. Well, his like his reaction is more more like, you know what? Fuck you. You're getting Avatar three anyway. But if you don't like it, well, then I guess I'm not doing four and five. Like, it's almost like, you know, why aren't you grateful you're getting more Avatar? Because <laughs> I'm not. And the fact that I just read that to break even, to break even, it has to make two billion fucking dollars. What? what the fuck <laughs> good luck jim enjoy Just your film. first enjoy your first colossal box office failure Can't, yeah J- james cameron said this has to be like the third or fourth highest grossing film of all time for him to make a profit well i hope he's i hope he doesn't have any gay characters because he's gonna need that chinese money this time <laughs> yeah <it's>, yeah <laughs> yeah um I know I've been I I really want to for once be right and be like this will be the one that fucking tanks tanks him. Um, I almost want to watch it pirated just out of spite. Honestly, Sam, I'm I'm in I'm furious to this day that that's the fucking film coming out on my thirtieth goddamn birthday. <laughs> oh man, for those who are like, when's your birthday? Look at the release date. For I've told the way of water, and you'll have your answer. I think last year I had Scream, which was pretty sweet. Uh, uh, that's nice. I did get the the server line that the new Joe Bob, the Christmas special for Joe Bob this year, is also airing on my birthday. So I get that, and that made me very happy. There you go. There you so, go. Yeah, I was like, oh, thank God, because I'm not watching Avatar. I'm not seeing a theater for that three hour fucking piece of shit. Um, so yeah, back to airplane. So yeah, that that's why that's there. That was a legit like, hey, we're going to do uh the third installment. The box office said no. Um, box office would kill it. 
because I think it only made like it was a fifteen million dollar budget and it didn't even make thirty million. So even wow. for back then, that's not good. That's equivalent to like we didn't even break even. We didn't make a profit off this film. Um, so they nixed it and they just kept it. So to this day, on home video releases, if you watch on HBO Max, which is how I watched it because it's on there, um, they just kept it intact. So it's still there, and now it's just more of a funny, aha joke that wasn't meant to be a joke. I love that it's like, hey, we can make this R-rated, but why bother? Or we could take the Airplane 3 tag off, but why bother? It's like, nobody gives a shit about this movie anymore. <laughs> nobody gave, nobody ever gave a shit about this movie. <laughs> One really did. You had people turning it down. So, like, this script is a retreat. I gotta go fucking solve mysteries, sirs, okay? Oh, boy. Yeah, I think you made the right call. Robert Stack. Robert, unsolved mysteries guy. Again, that was for Josh. That God, he was getting so infuriated because I kept saying it. <laughs> He's just sitting there going, it's Robert Stack. So I just started doubling down. And kept saying it, and it just oh god, I got him good on that one. But that's not the point. And that is actually all I have on airplane to the sequel because there is virtually nothing. Everything else I was fine. I was like, this joke is for this movie. I was like, I don't, I'm not writing what every single joke has to do with every single film. <laughs> yeah, trivia means a different means a different thing to me than it does to a lot of people. Like, I don't care who was in what movie, like, in the trivia. Like, I want to hear production stories. Ah. Yeah, it's always fun when I'm like, oh, Wikipedia doesn't have anything. Oh, Google doesn't have anything. So sometimes I do a Google search see if I can find, like, a different website or something. Especially if it's, like, a rare case where I don't have the film. Because everyone's like, what do you mean you own a bad film? Well, if it's ever, if we're ever doing certain franchises, I own all the films in the franchise. So I can just pull out my damn bonus features on that sometimes. Um... But if it's never that case, I'm like, well, okay, I am to be. Let's see, we got your trivia section. Sometimes it's pulled through. Sometimes I'm like, this is shit. I don't care about how this show goes to that or that. Chuck Connors was in this movie with so and so, and that's why they made the joke in fucking airplane too. So I don't give a fuck. Yeah, I'm with you. That happens on filmgasm sometimes too. You got to build something from nothing. It's cool when you're just reading yourself, but for the sake of content, I'm like, eh, it's not something I need to. I want to do content, but for myself to read, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so unless you have anything to add, we can move, go ahead and move on to our words because it's like I said, not not the most girthy development hell this week. All I can say is, I think I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. <laughs> <laughs> it's really him, fan boys. All right, boys, let's grab some pictures. <laughs> Just start taking paintings <laughs> off the wall. <laughs> ah, uh, what a great, a classic. All right. First award, Zack Snyder. I don't got anything this week because Zack Snyder has been relatively quiet. I'm just going to wait till Netflix starts promoting his next movie. Uh, the worst scene. What do you got? I went with the scene where Ted has to get the bomb from Salucci. Uh, a, like, this was based on a scene from Airport where Dean Martin's trying to get the bomb away from the person. And he's like, come on, I'm Dean Martin. I'm cool. Don't you want to give me the bomb? It's not what he said, but that's what I heard. Uh, <laughs> in this movie, I just feel like they wasted a lot of opportunities for some comedy because it's played fairly straight. And then also the bomb has like no bearing on the story. It's like they need the bomb to to destroy the fake Hal computer. But it's just like, can I have the bomb? And then Scraps takes the bomb. The whole scene is just weird. And I, it doesn't really mesh with the rest of the movie. And I, I feel like they wasted some opportunities there. Yeah, like, I kind of laughed when he was like, he accidentally said bomb. Loud, or like, he says the impotence part. Like, that made me laugh when he's like, it's not your fault, you're impotent. And he's just like, oh. and I think he says like, nobody has to know you're impotent. Yeah, that's, no one has that's to. He's like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah, you just see him and go, oh shit. I forget it's Robert Hayes, right? That's the name that yeah. plays uh Ted. I yes. didn't cry, like he does bring it to the film. Like he's has the same energy he does in the first one. Um 
but yeah, no, it's not one of the better scenes. And like you said, it and that can kind of be applied to the whole film. There's a lot of stuff that just doesn't really mesh as well that's brought into the story. Um, yeah, this this bomb thread does another thing. And then they do like a quick little like they try doing a quick little coda with this character at the end that just isn't really that good. Yeah. Um, they, they tried yeah. to do a. I just want to tell you all. I just want to tell you both. Good luck. We're all counting on you. But they didn't have anything like that, so that's what they tried to do. Yeah, so yeah, it, not one of the better scenes that they they had in here. For when it comes to the new, I'm glad you picked something that's newer, because for my scene, it goes back to the repeat gag thing. Um, and for me, because I picked the scene when over, uh, I think technically his name was Unger, but it sounds like they're saying under, and uh, <laughs> and done are introducing themselves in the cockpit, and then it proceeds just to be a repeat gag from the first film. That's why I didn't want to say and it. It's not. It's not that it's even like. I'm sitting there just like stone face, like I'm kind of chuckling. But like I'm thinking like the Vector Roger scene was funnier. Vector, Roger, over, Vector. Yeah. Huh? Roger, Roger. What's our Vector Victor? Yeah. yeah, that was funny. You know what it felt like to me? It felt like watching, say, like Abin Costello's Who's on First routine, but like 30 years later when they're old and still doing it. Yeah. This was hilarious, but now it's kind of just like, all right, I've seen this. What else you got? Yeah, it's like I'm watching. Like I've seen this. It's not the other side. And then like the the pilot, he starts making that weird face, like he's trying to show like he's in on it. Like we've done this before, face. But it's not landing. It just makes it look like he's kind of tired because it just doesn't stop. It keeps going, so it doesn't really work. I'm just like I, I just I remember kind of, after a while I was like, okay, we're still doing this. Okay, we're still oh, okay. Shut the fuck up. Move on, movie. It also weird like I I first was introduced to Peter Graves when I saw Men in Black Two, and he looked tired there, and that was two thousand two. And then nineteen eighty two, he looked exactly the same, and still tired. Like this guy was just going through the motions for two decades, and I was just, I couldn't believe that. Like Peter Peter Graves was always old. <laughs> always old yeah yeah it yeah it this is, is kind of like to me kind of going into like what i talk about like there's just so many scenes where like the new jokes don't really land like you said with the bomb joke or it's like yeah like i kind of chuckled a little like i said the most i got out of that i laughed was like when he actually said out loud he was impotent and that was it besides that like the whole scene where like they're all latching on him he's kind of like stopping and looking at them I didn't laugh because I was waiting for him to say something. That's what it looks like what it was leading to. He was going to say some kind of joke, but then it just kept going. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and then with this, it's them like setting up. And I'm sitting there as I'm watching the issue of the news, I'm like, oh shit, don't do it. And then they start doing it. I'm like, oh, they're just repeating the gag. And it's not nearly as funny. And now I have to sit through this scene. <laughs> yeah, I get what, you're, I get what you're coming from. You know what's odd? I just watched this today. And I, I'm having trouble recalling a lot of the gags and the jokes, but I can give you the full rundown of the first airplane right now. Yeah. This yeah. this film doesn't really stick like airplane does. Like it's actually been a couple of years since I've seen airplane. I can still quote jokes from them because I just found it so fucking hilarious. Yeah. Staying power uh, is important in every genre. Yeah. Let me try. I can talk chive. I did like seeing the jive guy again testifying. <laughs> you swear to tell the whole truth, like ain't no thing. And then he's like, sl- he slaps five with the Bible. That that made me laugh. Yeah, that was good. Oh, <laughs> uh, all right. Um, now for the next one, the Ed Wood, the worst line. What uh, what did you come up with? Uh, this was just so ill advised and just kind of mean so i i went with it um it's when they're talk uh the little kid i don't remember his name billy or johnny or some shit was talking to his dad about you know is life going to be different on the moon and his dad's like yeah new friends new kids to play with and new life's gonna be great and the kid just goes does that mean no more questions about the rape trial <laughs> and dad's just like hey you know they're all they all they're all asking for it like what the fuck <laughs> where did this come from it was just it wasn't funny. It was just mean spirited and like, oh my God. You know it's funny. So, I put this I put the same thing actually. I put the <laughs> part when he freaks out, he's like, 
anyway she was asking for it they're asking for it all the time i'm like actually i was like whoa whoa yeah yeah that whole bit and then mom's like you know he never like slaps billy at home maybe he's just an asshole yeah that whole scene was so i was supposed to be the you know jim never has a second cup of coffee at home homage from the first movie but it was just uncomfortable yeah it's un it's a very uncomfortable scene and um it like they don't even try to find a way to like make it work later i mean like let's find a way to revisit this and make it actually like work or something it's literally like this scene happens these jokes happen and we never see this family again yeah very strange decision and yeah it just kind of leaves you like okay can i can i laugh again please yeah <laughs> like, i was watching something funny now i know i was watching like can we go back to something that's funny <laughs> I want to see Captain Over say inappropriate things to children again, please. Please. Can we not get to a scene where, like, especially because, like, that's the punchline. The punchline is when he goes, anyway, she was asking for, like, that's the punchline to this joke. And I'm like, look, you you know, if you know me, I'm always, like, especially when it comes to, like, stand up, I think, you know, obviously I've been on the point that, like, I'm the South Park guy, though, which is everything's funny or nothing at all. But again, if you're going to tackle something like this, you got to you got to be very careful with how you tackle it. That's what that's what yeah. I say. Like. You have to be fucking careful because that is at the end of the day a horrific thing that has happened to people. Well, yeah, and it's not it's not you know I'm not I'm not very much like oh a rape joke. I hate this movie now. It was just a bad in poor taste rape joke that yes. didn't have didn't work. Didn't have a punchline. It was just like a shock value moment and I don't like that when there's no point to it. In a movie that's not a shock movie, to have that moment just feels unearned and unnecessary. Yeah, because can can you imagine if you've gone through something horrific like that, and you're just like, hey, let's go see Airplane 2, because Airplane 1, I mean, doesn't, it has moments, obviously, you know, you could argue that, like, the scene where they're slapping the one could be, like, shocking. Um, no, nah, because that's, that's all played for, like, goofy laughs. That's not, like, they're not actually... You know, if they were actually hurting that lady, then it would be like, oh, boy. yeah, true. Like the film, you know, knows that balance. This one went straight for like, let's just make this show. Can like, I can't imagine like you're seeing the film if you, you know, God bless you've been through something like this in your life. And then this show comes up. You're like, if I'm sitting there, never had anything like this happen to me. And I'm sitting there going, whoa, 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 whoa movie. Cannot imagine. Cannot imagine. Yep. I got gotcha. you. So I'm, I think it's interesting we both went there. Yeah, it's just yeah. I'm because I'm with you, man. It's, this this was a case of poor taste. Like I said, if you're gonna make these jokes, you gotta fucking be careful when you're making these jokes. You gotta be aware of uh, the people that are watching your film. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. Yeah, I didn't expect us to supposed to have that and have that that uh conversation. That was a that was a moment right there on on. Beyond the bad history. Uh, next up, Steven Seagal. The worst performance. Worst mm-hmm. performance. Hard to hard to pick in a in a comedy movie. You know, I think the principal cast, I think Robert Hayes, uh Julie Haggerty, I believe her name is. Yeah, that, that place is love interest that apparently they aren't together anymore. Yeah. And then uh Lloyd Bridges. I think they're all great. I think they all do a great job again. Uh, ultimately, I gave this to Chad Everett, who plays uh, Simon, Elaine's new hubby, who's just a complete prick. Mm. And okay. really just not funny and has like no real bearing on the story. His whole character doesn't matter. Yeah, you could write him out of the movie and I would yeah. not know. So he, he, the only joke he has is like when she's like, don't fall apart on me. And he literally starts falling apart. It then becomes cello at one point. Yeah. So, yeah, he was just useless and not funny and completely forgettable in a movie that's forgettable, which is like, are you like, you didn't even register? Yeah, yeah it whenever he popped up, I was like, I remember when he popped up later, I was like, oh, he was on the plane the whole time. <laughs> I had that moment while I was watching, I was like, he's he's on the plane. Oh, and then he disappears again. I'm like, oh, OK. God damn it, movie. Um. Yeah. I this might be a hot take. I wasn't expecting mine to be a hot take because I had three options. 
that I was right now. Because I, I mean, I had, I'm like you. It's kind of hard with comedy because especially when people are like at least committing the best they can. Um, so I at first I had I'll tell you my two options before I tell you who I picked. I at first had Chuck Connors because you get someone to at that time was a name with everyone else. Like the guy's a what was a well known TV actor, did a lot of westerns. Like you get him and you severely underutilize his ass in this. Um, and then I also had Rip Turn for the same reason. I was like, you have a fucking comedy goldmine right there that again you severely underutilize. And I didn't even know it at first. At first, I'm watching it, and I was like, who this guy looks familiar. And then once I finally like picked up on the voice, I'm like, holy shit, is that is that Dodgeball? Dodgeball? And then I looked and I was like, Rip Turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm with you, man. They yeah, never cast somebody with gravitas if you're not gonna fucking use them. Yeah, it's like you could have gotten rid of them on I nothing. And again, they're both cases that had they been around the movie, nothing would have changed. Um, so I had those two at first, but here's my hot take one, because uh you said he was great, and I thought he wasn't as great in this as he was in the first one. I put Lloyd Bridges. Ooh, okay. Hear me out. I thought he was one of the, the best parts of an already great first film with his whole like, you know, I I picked the wrong way to quit sniffing glue and all that shit. And the dude was outstanding. And here they make a big deal in the movie about like, we got to bring him back. And I'm like, oh, shit, they're bringing him back. So I actually did not. I didn't look up the cast list and I was doing I think I was writing like my shit down to get part of the credits for playing. So I was like, oh, shit, he's back. They're getting him back. Wood Bridges is in this. And, you know, he comes back, and he comes back with such, like, a bomb. And I'm like, oh, shit, here we go. And he's in the film for, I would say, probably an outstanding total of, like, 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, luckily he doesn't get any repeat gags, but, like, I just don't think his jokes landed as much in this as they did in the first one. And that's my big thing. I just don't think he was as well utilized or as, as funny in this one as he was the first one. He had some jokes, like, I did laugh. When Stryker gets on there, and he's like, oh, thank God, a man this time. <laughs> Let me talk to him. I was like, oh, my God. I love when the lady behind him looks at him like, what the fuck did you just say? <laughs> uh, okay. I under- Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, he's he's mo- It's more of a stunt cast in this one. It's like, remember him from the first one? He was funny. Watch him be kind of funny this time. Uh, yeah, like, he did get the repeat gag of him, like, standing in front of the picture of himself. Looking yeah. aggressive. I love that in the first one. This time I was kind of like, really? Yeah, uh, I was like, all the repeat things. So I was hoping that would have been a case where I would have been down had they done a repeat. I picked the wrong week thing. I would have been totally okay with that. But they they did it. That was the one repeat thing. I'm like, no, we can't do that. I'm like, what the fuck? I picked the wrong week to quit shooting up. Like they could have they could have done something like that. Yeah. Um, to me, it's just like the worst performance. I I I think that Lloyd for what was probably a, a paycheck gig, probably a, you know, a day's worth of shooting did a serviceable job for what this movie was. Mm. And the worst performance to me goes to somebody who just is completely off, like completely misfiring on all cylinders. And I just felt, you know, I, I didn't see that in Lloyd Bridges. I thought that, you yeah. know, for, for a sequelized version of this character, it's, it's not bad. Mm. Well, that's what I said. This was a tough one for me. Is um, I was like, who am I? Who the f-? I was looking into that film was like, had it blank, and I was like, who the fuck am I going to put for this? And like I said, I know this is a hot take. I know I'm probably on a on here, and I'm not even saying he's bad. I don't think he's terrible. Like he's clearly trying. I think it's the film that does him dirty. Because then when he does get that moment where he's like, he gets up, he's like, let me tell you something. Ted Striker is one of the best damn pot. And then just fucking falls. I'm thinking, oh shit, we're about to get some unhinged. Like, here we go. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. That's his last fucking scene. <laughs> he disappears for the rest of the film. Well, now we're now we're in, you know, Shatner's camp. It's a new area of expertise. We need space expertise. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, right when I'm thinking, like, oh, okay, here we go. It's done. And at that point, all I could think was, and then when Shatner takes over, Shatner was so good that our thing was like. No offense, you could have kept Lloyd Bridges off of this one and just had Shatner take over. Because yeah, probably he was hilarious the whole time he was on screen. <laughs> yeah. All right. I get yeah, I, I get that. 
I just, yeah. you know, I got no hate and I, I can't give any negative props to the Bridges family. I, I love Lloyd. I love Jeff. I, I can't like, think Bo is in, but I'm sure he's good too. Look, I don't have any hate on the family either. I'm just saying like, like I said, he's trying the movie does him dirty. Um, yeah. just big time. And especially because I, it would have helped more if they had not hyped it up in the film so much. And they not been like, let's, we gotta bring him in. He's the only one that can talk to Ted and it's just like a big moment of like, oh shit, he's back. And then like the film kind of underserves the living shit out of him. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So that that's why I went with it. Like I said, this was one of my harder ones to do um this week. So yeah. I knew uh, I knew I as soon as you said I was like, fuck, this is gonna be a hot take. God damn it. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be fine. <laughs> uh well, all right, good stuff. Uh with that. Michael Bay, worst filmmaking decision. I think if you're going to make a sequel, stand, you know, it's, you're making another film. You're making an, a film that's different, that's separate from the first movie. So maybe rely on your film to stand on its own and not frequently flash back to the movie everybody loved. That's what I got. The flashbacks to the first film. It's like, hey, maybe this isn't going so well, but you know what was great? Airplane. Remember Airplane? That was awesome. Here's some Airplane. <laughs> yeah. There is one film in the history of films I've watched that does that. That's uh, Silent Night, Daily Night Part 2. A lot of chunk of the film is Billy, uh, you know, the brother of the, the killer from the first film. Um, Billy re- <laughs> recounting the events of the film and them doing straight up flashbacks and showing scenes from the film because they didn't have enough footage to do an actual sequel. But then, like, when you do get the sequel elements, they're so out, the movie's so outrageous and commits so fucking hard to what they're doing that it's like, okay, I can forgive that because the sequel elements do commit. But that's the only film I've watched where it works for me. And even then, I can, you know, still be like, it's definitely a flaw if you're not prepared. But like, that's the only film. Besides that, I'm with you. It's like this, like, all you're doing is reminding me of the film I could be watching instead, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Also, why is every serial killer in a Christmas themed horror movie named Billy? I don't know. It just told it just told me never name any possible kids I have, Billy. No Billy, no Fred, no Jason, no Michael. Yeah, you got some names to avoid. <laughs> um I'm just calling boy. Yeah. Just boy. <laughs> hey you. Um, you. But yeah, I think flashing back to airplane is lazy. And just telling people that you don't have any faith in the film you're making and you're just hoping nostalgia rides this thing through. Yeah. I don't think, honestly, that's the difference, right? Like, like I said, in Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 case, just to kind of bring that back, they literally, they did shoot a sequel and then they went, fuck, we don't have enough footage because they were kind of fast-tracking it. So it was more of a necessity thing, like, we got to do something here. Whereas with this one, they easily could have shot, I mean, there was like a two-year gap between the first one and this one. Um, they easily had enough time. They easily could have been like, hey, let's pad this out. Let's think of stuff to do. Instead, it's let's just redo what the first one did. And also, you want to do some flashbacks and like just show shit from that movie to kind of pad out the runtime here? This is a lazy way. This is them just not wanting to find any creative outlet to. Well, because look, I even if they tried, nothing was going to, I think, ever beat the first airplane. But you could have had your anchor man too. You could have had your twenty-two ton feet. You could have had, you know, insert other more successful comedy sequels. And that you probably would have had people that still liked it and embraced it had you just tried a little bit fucking harder. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um hmm. with that, mine's a little bit kind of like off what you said. Um, but also kind of talking on that stuff like with the, you know, the the earlier um the rape joke we talked about earlier. Um, and that's like this. Um, how I put it was like this film never successfully finds a way to have the repeat gags from the original mesh with the new jokes, and it kind of makes for like a tedious. In the case of like like so that rape joke, often totally confusing film. Um, or in the case of like the bomb, where it's like it gets kind of serious. Where it's like this film is kind of all over the place. Where you're like, ah ha ha, and then you're just saying you're like cringing at a joke that you're like oh why would you make that even in 1982 why would you make that joke oh boy um and then center going at the bomb scene like am i supposed to be laughing right now because i'm not 
yeah, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that going around. A lot of jokes that don't land or just weird moments that I'm sure they thought was hilarious, but not not really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tone is important. It, yeah. Like what is like the guy that's like shaving and keeps cutting himself? Like at first I was like, hi, then they kept cutting to it. And I was like, okay, this isn't funny anymore. Yeah, like four times. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> rules of three, assholes. Rules of three. <laughs> yeah. All right. Interesting. Good pick. Yeah. It. I was trying to not have it sound completely like what I figured we were going to hit on because we know we would be talking about it quite a bit anyway in this film. Yeah. So that's why I was trying to worry in a certain way. But uh, uh, with that, let's go on and pick our, our positive, right? Our silver lining, a positive we took from this. What What did you take? William Shatner. That's a good one. He, my God. So this was 82. This was the same year as Wrath of Khan. (laughs) Which is, he's, yeah, you know, so serious in that. And it's probably his greatest turn as Kirk is Wrath of Khan. And then he turns around and he plays, was it Burt Murdoch? Or something like that? Buzz Murdoch? I don't, yeah. And he's just, Chewing the scenery and just having the time of his life saying outlandish shit, just being a complete idiot for just like half an hour. And his introduction's great, where he's just, you know, on the computer screen and then shuts it down and walks through the computer screen because it's a door. <laughs> that was funny as hell. Yeah, I, I thought he was tower. great. He, hmm? we, we don't have a tower. Why doesn't anyone tell me these things? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just love when he's freaking out about the lights and he's just like, you know, lean into her, lean into her. You got her. <laughs> Like, don't lose her, don't lose her this time, Ted. <laughs> Talking about Elaine. Like, it was good. He was he was really good. He he helped make the third act like way better because he was just committing. He's the he knew what kind of movie he was in. He knew this was a paycheck gig for a comedy sequel nobody's really gonna care about. So he he did his best. He was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shine. Yeah, it, it makes you when he pops up all it's like I said earlier, all I was like, God, you guys should have bought him in so much sooner. Cause he kept he instantly steals it from everyone the moment he comes on screen he is so committed when he walks into like the bridge and they're like captain and like the warshock te- he's like what do you need warshock and he's like telling him what he sees on each one and then hands it back it's like it's a bird it's a cow it's a horse with a hat on <laughs> and then just keeps walking with his <laughs> with like conviction oh yeah it's like you can tell he's channeling his persona his, you know, obviously, like I said, Rathcon this out, so Star Trek fever is kind of in full gig, especially for his his tenure on that show and the movies he did. Um, so he's ha- he's bringing that, but totally hamming it up and clearly having the time of his life not being serious with it. Like, you know, I'm going to play my persona, basically, but I'm going to ham it the fuck up. <laughs> it worked. It was great. I love when he, like, looks through the periscope and he sees the fucking Enterprise and his eyes widen, like, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was cute. He was he was funny. Yeah, no, that that that's a good one. Um, I went a little bit more broad with mine. Um, and I did say that. Look, you know, well, I know, like, you know, go with me here, people. No, do a lot of these strokes land for me? No. Do a lot of them work for me? No. But with that said, there's a smidgen of the spirit of the original film still intact. Much like the first film, I did notice that the jokes are flying at the audience like a mile a minute. They're just going, 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 joke, 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 joke. And I'll give them that. I'll give them that much credit. I will give that much to them for my server line that, yes, at the very least, that spirit, that part of the original is still alive and will of like just throw these jokes out. Because, hey, if one doesn't work, we got no one coming right up. It's just that the differences in the first one, damn near every single one lands. Every fucking single one is funny that you have to rewatch it to catch the ones you missed in your laughter. Whereas with this one, a couple land, but hey, you know, there's at least hopefully going to be another one coming up that you laugh at. I love that your, your award is basically, they didn't defile the first movie completely. <laughs> like, it's, it's still there. There's a little bit still there. Like, okay, I don't know how positive that is, but okay. Do you, ha, ha, do you have me know that, like, I'm getting really good with my server lines to basically give, like, backhand compliments to these movies? 
Oh yeah, I have noticed. <laughs> it's impressive. I know how to make it sound so positive, and really just me sitting going, "Fuck you, movie." Yeah, it reminds me of like the greatest backhanded compliment I ever heard was in an episode of uh, Playground Insults, a YouTube series where actors and like co-stars will yeah. mock each yeah. other with you know ridiculous stuff to try to get the other one to break. And it was uh, Chris Pratt versus line. yeah, they're great. Chris Pratt versus Jennifer Lawrence when they were promoting Passengers. And Chris Pratt said, "It's such a shame to meet someone." you thought you'd like. <laughs> that is the greatest compliment insult I've ever heard. <laughs> Did she break on that one? Yeah, she she broke every single time. He was good. Of course, she broke him with where do you keep your Oscar? <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, it's funny, man. Real quick aside, like where Chris Pratt I tend to like the guy outside of films, like when he does things like that. I think he's really funny. It's just, goddamn, man, can we get enough of him in movies? Like, for me, it's just fatigue, and I'd like him to play somebody who's not Star Lord. Yeah, just one time, <laughs> one time. Even that whole thing about like the uproar with him, you know, being Mario, which I get, I do understand the uproar. If I'm being serious, I'm sure there's a guy who is Italian or sounds Italian that could have played that role instead of Chris Pratt. Maybe, you know, get the voice cast of, like, the thousands of Nintendo games that have been coming out over the past two decades. Yeah, in this case, there were options, but somehow we land on Chris Pratt. Um, you know, I do like the rest of the casting. I'm not going, like, Charlie Day is Luigi, Jack Black as Bra- Bowser, like, fuck yeah. Did you almost uh, call him Browser. I did. Um, <laughs> Seth Rogen plays Donkey Kong, I believe. Like, the rest of the voice cast is kick-ass. I'm going to try to move on, act like I didn't just say. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it's like, and then when that trailer dropped, which I thought was a good trailer, I was like, oh, shit, okay. Like, Jack Black's going to crush it. I like the little, like, Luigi's Mansion thing we saw at the end of it. But then Mario came on screen, and they made such a big deal. Like, everyone come down. And he's, he's he's learning Italian. Like, he's going to sound. It'll be fine. Guess what I heard when I saw that quick snippet? Fucking Chris Pratt. Not saying Italian. Well, to be honest, Mario never speaks Italian. He speaks of English in a stereotypical Italian accent. So do we really want to hear Chris Pratt do that? <laughs> I mean, be yeah. careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah, you know, hey, you know, I'm hoping I'm wrong. Like I said, I, I want that film to actually be successful. I'm 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 happy to see video game adaptations getting taken so much more seriously than they used to, but I just I hope the Chris Pratt is because I'm thinking I think a lot of people are with you in the fatigue. I just hope it doesn't you know affect. I don't think it'll affect the movie. I think the fact that we're getting a Mario movie is going to make a lot of money. There's just too many kids that are going to be like, oh my god, Mario! It's going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, but getting back in, bringing it back in now that we had that quick side on good old Chris Pratt. You know, that can be a hot topic because I I have learned that apparently he is controversial for a lot of people because I get. I think a church he's tied to or something. That, that. Not oh getting into it. Yeah. Chris Pratt's a Christian. Who knew everybody? I I, I don't know. There's, there's, it's weird. But uh I haven't looked into it. But that's all I got on um the my my silver lining and the awards, unless you got more to add, you're good to find out what's in the box. What's in the fucking box? Give me the gun. Yeah. Uh, kind of a mixed bag here. Uh, a lot of people love it. A lot of people thought it was okay. Not a lot of hatred. More just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think I gave it. I think I myself gave it like two and a half on Letterbox. I'm like, it's all right. I gave it three. Made me laugh. If it, if it makes me laugh at least four times, I'll be like, all right, you get a half. I like how you have a system. <laughs> I do. If I if a movie makes me laugh or makes me cry or scares me, if if emotion comes out. I consider it an achievement. I don't. Good for you. Uh, two point eight. The, well, I I don't. Depending on like, it just depends on the film, really. Yeah, two point eight out of five. So, middle of the road for the most part. Uh, here are five reviews that I hope can make you laugh. This first one's from Single White F- Famalian. 
My parents came over to my house and my dad chose this to watch. And in the first five minutes, there's titties. And I was like, well, and it didn't get better from there. One star. <laughs> yeah, you, you were just saying it's PG. We could watch this with family. And then like so many, so many tits in the first five minutes. Yeah. And you're like, oh, OK, never mind. And then there's a rape joke. And you're like, oh, God damn it. Fuck the PG rating, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, just, I was like, did you pick that because of my parents? Because I, I, I've had to make that hard fucking decision with movies where I'm like, hey, let's watch this. I'm like, hey, hold on. Give me like five minutes. I'm like fucking Googling IMDb. <laughs> like, what I oh gosh. what I would what I would do, I used to just leave the room like when the scene's coming up. If I'd seen the movie before, I'd be like, oh, sex scene's coming up. I have to go to the bathroom. And I would just go to the bathroom for like, I just stand in there for like five minutes waiting for the scene to end and then come back like nothing happened. But in the past few years, I've just been leaning into it. Just been like, look at that. Huh? That's impressive. Look at that. You see that? And if I draw attention to it, it's no longer awkward. Now it's something to laugh about. And I would love to do that, but the problem is my my parents being super religious and my mom considers it smut. So oh, that's frightening. Okay. Yeah. So I can't do that. Well, now I'm just all right, I'm gonna try that. Now I'm next time I'm watching a movie and there's a sex scene, I'm gonna stand up and shout, unclean and see what happens. <laughs> Shame. Shame. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And like my dad's cool with it still. Luckily, like he doesn't give a shit, but yeah. yeah. I've just really stopped caring about that. Like if I'm gonna I'm gonna watch whatever I watch, and whoever wanders in is gonna face the consequences of whatever I'm watching. I'm not changing what I'm watching because somebody walked in. They're gonna watch what I'm watching. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he doesn't care about news to an extent. If it's, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I apparently this is a problem a lot of people have. I know I I found a solution. <laughs> um, this next one's from Wood. I okay. Sorry, before we read the next one, I would hope that if I were to have kids, let it be known, I won't make it awkward. They won't watch a damn movie or show with sex scenes with me when they're of a certain age when we're like okay like I obviously don't want to like one like two three years old and we haven't had to talk but yeah i'm gonna be cool that like no sex is a natural part of life like we can watch it together and it not be awkward when i have kids and we're watching a movie and i'm like i'm talking like this is when i'm like 50 60 and there's a movie on and sex scene comes up i'm going to embarrass everybody by just loudly declaring tits and then to see I'm what gonna, happens. I'm gonna put on jackass. So so I can sit and be like, would you guys look at that dick? <laughs> look what's happening <laughs> to that dick on camera. Look at that cock. Like just yeah, lean into it. I'm telling you, lean into it and it makes everything better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of cock, this guy's <laughs> name is Wood. <laughs> Segway. You know when you tape two empty two-liter soda bottles and spin some water inside to make a cool twister? Then you flip it over and do it again, but it's slightly less cool? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, is that it? Is that what it is? That's it. That's the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> oh. I like it. That's perfect. Like, yeah, it's the same thing, but it's not as good. Yeah. He <laughs> threw me into because I was like, yeah, dude, I remember doing that. And then when he started, like... Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> um, this one's from Brent Van Homewagen. Uh, oh, I I realized I forgot to give the stars. First one was one star. Second one was three stars. This one, a lot of rehash jokes from the first movie. Plus, the whole thing feels very forced. I agree with that. Despite no. being an unoriginal movie in its genre, it's still funnier than most comedies nowadays. Three and a half stars. And I was like. I picked that one because I was like, you know what? You're kind of right. He is kind of right. I don't think I gave it three and a half. I think I still stick with two and a half, three stars. But he is right. Yeah. It kind of goes back to a, uh, well, yeah. I know we are talking about it before we recorded, but yeah, I'd say, it, you know, for reasons we talked about before we recorded, it's definitely funnier than most comedies are nowadays. I agree. I think you'll like this one a lot. This one's from Men on Film. This was like listening to me explain the jokes from Airplane. Another entry into the large tome of PG boobs. Three stars. Yeah. And it is like someone trying to explain the plot of Airplane from memory. Yeah. 
That's nice. Uh yeah, and yeah, there is a there is a tome of PG rated uh movies with boobs if you want to take that challenge and find them. I think we all have. <laughs> Uh, this last one's from Syrah993. Eh, they tried. Two stars. <laughs> yeah, can't argue with that. They certainly, <laughs> they said they were going to make Airplane 2, and they, they did exactly that. They, 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 they are people of their words. <laughs> I'm right. They didn't say it was going to be good. They just said it was going to be, and they weren't wrong. <laughs> I like the idea of the executive meeting. So it's just going to be like, good or anything like oh we're going to make a movie (laughs) that's such a great response to that question it'll be a movie that's for sure of all the movies ever made it will be one of them (laughs) no one's going to refute that (laughs) we're making airplane too we told you we're going to make airplane too that's happening i also love a studio just asking straight up like is this going to be good (laughs) Like somebody's gonna say, probably not. <laughs> oh boy, uh, that's what's in the box. That was a good one. I, I like that. All right, let's let's wrap this up and never talk about airplane two ever again, and only talk about the exceptional first film known as airplane. <laughs> Exclamation! I can, I can work with that. I can yeah. live with that. <laughs> Before I what's on next week. Let's do our usual housekeeping for social media. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under Filmgasm Productions. If you want to shoot us a recommendation, feel free to email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. And if you'd like to donate and support us in that way, you can find us on Anchor. Finally, feel free to go on our site, filmgasm.com, for reviews, trailers, articles, and all of our episodes. Next week, we'll be looking at an early Jim Carrey starring horror comedy. What's been? Nice. Is this our first uh, Jim Carrey? It is, and not. I think one people probably didn't think we'd uh, do for our first Jim Carrey film. So I'm sure there's a plethora of other ones people thought we would do first. Yeah, for certain actors we will have plenty of material for. With Jim Carrey, regrettably, is one of those guys. Yes, Jim Carrey, Adam Sandler. I'm looking at both of you, even though I do love a lot of y'all's early comedies. Yeah, but your later stuff. Woo. Wolf. But uh, once bitten, I've heard, I've seen, I remember watching part of this when I was a kid and thinking Jim Carrey vampires, ooh, and then I never followed up, and I'm glad I didn't because this is qu- quite a reviled film. Yeah, I was like, and I think it's like I don't, I can't, I, I mean, we'll find out next week on do my research, but it looked like this is either like his debut or like one of his earliest films. Uh, oh yeah, that. this is pre in Living Color, I think. Like this is really early Jim Carrey. I think he was yeah. still James Carey. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Because yeah. he didn't really I know between Living Color and then Saturday Night Live when people kind of saw the the physical stuff he was doing was when he started to kind of skyrocket like oh this guy is like really good with like physical comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to watch this free it's on Tubi. Um, so that's where you can check it out. That's where we're going to check it out. Yeah. Sure, we'll check it out, and I'm sure the whole time I was just thinking about like all the Jim Carrey films I could be watching <laughs> <laughs> that I do enjoy quite a bit. Yeah, I know the feeling. <sighs> On Filmgasm, uh, th- they'll that's right, they will. I'm taking a break. Uh, they'll be getting festive from one of the best films taking place on the worst day of the year, Black Friday. <laughs> Yeah, had this one scheduled for a while. Had to shift some things around so we could do Batman last week. But uh, now we're going Black Friday. This was such a delightful horror comedy that kind of came and went. And I want to look into it and watch it again. So. Yes. And you have hint, if you want something to watch on Black Friday and you think horror hasn't tapped into that day yet, they have now. Watch Black Friday. You won't regret it. You got Devin Sawa, Bruce Campbell, Michael J. Motherfucking White. (laughs) Like, this is a cast. And it's great. It's so much fun. Funny, scary. It can't say enough about this movie. Hell of a fun time. And if you're looking for another horror film to add to your horror film to watch on a holiday, 
you know, you got you got a Black Friday one in this one. So yep. Shop smart, shop as smart. I know that's not the store, but when I think of Bruce Campbell working in retail, that's all I can think of is shop smart. <laughs> shop as smart. <laughs> <laughs> and on uh on Oscar Sunday, they'll be looking at the film adaptation of the real known stage play Chicago. Oh yeah, Best Picture Showdown. We're gonna tackle five films nominated for Best Picture in 2002. Chicago beat them. Did it deserve it? Let's find out on Sunday. Oh yeah, I'm I'm glad I'm filing off my ass and looking up some of these films so I can actually say more on them. I find it hilarious that it took you this long. To be yes. like, maybe I should care a little bit. <laughs> maybe I should look it up because it's not always like something I know. Like seven, where I'm like, well, I know seven. I've seen seven. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's some obscure thirty shit that you have never heard of. <laughs> yes, or I haven't. I'm like, what genre is it? Because I don't even know off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> but with all that said, until then, surely after seeing this, you won't be tempted to try space travel. And don't call me Shirley. See you all next week on Beyond the Bed.